reproductive systems. We'll start with male reproductive and work our way through that and then we'll pause and make a new uh, recording or another uh, video for the female reproductive. So let's just start on our lecture outline uh, with male reproductive. We're going to start with introduction which is going to be a generic uh, intro for both male and female. So let's go ahead and we'll start on that. <clears throat> Okay, in our introduction, sexual reproduction is a process by which we're going to produce um, offspring. And those uh, germ cells that do that are called gametes, G-A-M-E-T-E-S. And when a male and a female gamete meet together during fertilization, uh, the new cell ends up having one full set of chromosomes from uh, the mother cell and one from the father cell. So organs of the reproductive system, functional uh, uh, Organization here would include number one, which would be the gonads, G-O-N-A-D-S. And they produce the gametes and they secrete hormones. <clears throat> A, in the male, those are known as the testes, T-E-S-T-E-S. -E and those produce sperm cells. And in the female, letter B, the ovaries produce ova, O-V-A, or eggs. Number two, you have a system of ducts, D-U-C-T-S, that receive, store, and move the gametes along. Number three, you have accessory sex glands, and those accessory sex glands are going to produce substances that are going to protect the gametes and aid them as they move along. And then number four, there's a set of supporting structures that are going to assist in getting the uh, gametes uh, together, and a female is going to assist or aid in the growth of the fetus during pregnancy. If you want to specialize in the female reproductive system uh, and treat diseases and uh, uh, disorders, that would be gynecology, would be that field. Uh, for male reproductive, it would be urology, which is the same as in the urinary system. So a urologist treats both male and female urinary system disorders as well as male reproductive system. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so let's go and start specifically on the male reproductive system. So that includes a series of structures which we just kind of talked about as an overview but let's look specific at the male. We have the testes down here which are the male gonads, right? Produce sperm, secrete hormones. We have a whole system and series of ducts which we'll talk about specifically later and name the different ones. Number three, you have accessory sex glands as we just did in the female there or in the, um, the uh, generic structures produce secretions which are going to mix with sperm to form semen so make a mental note of this right here or even write it down if you like semen and sperm are not one and the same okay uh, semen contains sperm sperm is a part of semen all right and then number four your supporting structures which in the male would include both the scrotum and the penis so the scrotum down here and the penis right here both are considered supporting structures so let's start with the scrotum so we're going to move and change our image we're going to look at a little bit different image here all right so we'll look from the front view anterior view scrotum basically it's an outpouching of the abdomen okay you have abdominal wall um, you have some loose skin superficial fascia hangs from the root of the penis Externally, there's a median ridge right here, and you can see that median ridge on the outside. If we specifically look here, it's called the raphe, R-A-P-H-E, right there. So let me get my pen out so we can highlight these things as we go. So that's the raphe right there. That's that external ridge you see right there. Kind of splits it into the pouch into two halves or two lateral portions. Internally, there's a scrotal septum, which runs right down the midline here. So here's the scrotal septum. We're looking at right there okay and that septum divides it into two sacs each sac contains a single testis t-e-s-t-i-s testis is singular testes es is plural okay septum consists of some fascia as well and smooth muscle tissue and this smooth muscle tissue that you see in there okay right here this little ridge is called the dartos muscle d-a-r-t-o-s the dartos muscle and you can also find it in the subcutaneous tissue of the scrotum, which is what you're looking at right here. So this is all dartos muscle as well. Okay, Causes wrinkling of the skin of the scrotum. <clears throat> so we're going to look at our model a little bit later. When we look at our model, you'll see that this is also the dartos muscle, the scrotal septum. 
made up of the dartos. And what the scrotum does allows the testes to maintain an environment that is about, and know this number please, two to three degrees Celsius lower than core body temperature. That's why the testes drop and are in the scrotum outside of the abdominal cavity so they can stay cooler because the sperm would not survive, as you'll see in letter A. This lower temperature is needed for proper production and survival of the sperm. <clears throat> now we have another muscle that you see here in pink. That muscle is known as the cremaster muscle right there, C-R-E-M-A-S-T-E-R, -E <clears throat> which is part of the internal oblique muscle. You might want to highlight that, make sure you remember that for test purposes. And it also assists uh, a testis by elevating it and bringing it up closer um, to the abdominal cavity both when it's cold, right, and during sexual arousal. And the dartos muscle, by the way, it's mentioned here, also helps to elevate the testis. So when it gets cold, the testes elevate to stay closer to the abdominal um, region, which helps to keep them warmer, okay? Don't worry about blood or nerve supply with these. So let's go and start looking at the individual testis. Each one of these is a testis, all right? Or testicles, testes or testicles, plural form. Uh, paired oval glands that develop in the posterior part of the abdomen of an embryo. All right. And then to start their descent in the last half of the seventh month of fetal development, they're going to drop down, come through the inguinal canal right here where they start their descent. Okay. And descend down into the scrotum down here. Testes, partially covered by a covering called the tunica albuginea, which you see right there. Okay, that's the covering right over the surface of the testis. Uh, the capsule of this, when we look at it from a side view, so now we're going to turn, we're going to make a cut through here, and we're going to look at this from a uh, frontal cut or sagittal cut. So let's go to this view, I believe it's right here. Yep, one more time, there we go. If I can get to that, let's try one more time here with that. Okay, <clears throat> so I have to erase my board. That's my problem. If I don't erase, I can't move forward. Okay, so here we go. Now we have it. Okay, so we have the tunica abugenia right here, this little white strip. Here's, we'll label it right there. Whoops. Let me get my pen so I can label. So there's the tunica abugenia, that little strip right there. And the tunica abugenia has essentially... Um, um, a capsules that this cap forms a capsule on the outside that extends inward. Okay, and these little inward extensions here are called septa, S-E-P-T-A, which is plural for septum, right? And those septa divide each testis into anywhere from 200 to 300 lobules. So you see where this lobule is bracketed right there. There's a lobule. So each one of these, remember, this is going to go around 360 degrees, all right? So there's 200 to 300 lobules. Know that number, okay? Each lobule is going to contain anywhere from one to three tightly coiled seminiferous tubules, these structures right here. So inside each lobule, these are the seminiferous tubules. And that's where spermatogenesis will occur. So if we cut through one of these tubules and just make a little cut like this and we look right through one of those, right, we're going to see some different cells in various stages of maturity. So if we look through it like this, let me erase my drawings again. It messes me up when I do that, okay? So this is what it's going to look like on the slides when you look at it. But I think for us, let's go this way first and we'll use this image, okay? So here's the lumen here of a seminiferous tubule. As we go from the lumen, working our way outward, okay? So seminiferous tubules are lined with spermatogenic cells, okay? And let's highlight those as well. So we have spermatogenic cells in different stages of maturity or development, right? So we will start here and we'll go from the least mature to the most mature. So we start right here against the basement membrane, okay? And the first one we see are called spermatogonia. <clears throat> spermatogonia, spermatogoniums plural, okay, spermatogonium is singular, spermatogonia plural, okay, and you'll see these develop from the primordial sperm uh, germ cells, and they line the periphery of the tubule, remember this is going to go completely around like this, so we've just cut through it, so on the periphery here, the bottom layer there is going to be the spermatogonia, 
all right now you'll notice it's in the to in state all right so in the to in state we like to say or refer to that as the um, diploid state so if I can kind of put that in there like this all right write it in there real quickly diploid which means in the to in state it has the maximum number of chromosomes which would be 46 chromosomes two pairs of 23 okay then as way mature, they're going to come out here, and the next stage will be primary spermatocyte, which are still in the 2N state, diploid, so make sure you know that. <clears throat> then they're going to mature into secondary spermatocytes, and we'll look at this a little closer to see exactly the pr pro uh, process as it goes on in a minute. Okay, so the secondary spermatocytes are next. Now, these, as you notice, are in the 1N state, so we're going to refer to this as the haploid state, okay? Kind of hard to write with a mouse, but easier than pulling the board up and going back and forth. So in the haploid state, the one in state. So now we only have 23 chromosomes because we're going to go through meiosis to get to that. The next level of maturity would be a spermatid, again, in the one in state. <clears throat> and finally, once they reach maturity and come close to the lumen, then they become uh, spermatozoa or sperm cells, which are located in the lumen. So we have a few other cells we're going to see in our view here. And when you see it in this slide, you'll also see them there. Okay. A couple of these cells this is embedded between the spermatogenic cells. All right. In here. All right. Are what are known as sustenacular or sertoli cells. Sustenacular cells. Sertoli cells right here. These little ones here. So I guess I should probably write sustenacular up on our board so we can see the spelling in that all right so sustenacular cells <clears throat> okay sustenacular or sertoli cells okay <clears throat> it's capital s so that's a proper name sertoli cells okay um so the sustenacular or Sertoli cells are going to be embedded in between these spermatogenic cells in here. Okay. Um, we're also going, they're going to go all the way from the basement membrane all the way to the lumen, as you'll see there. All right. The other type of cell, all right, um, we'll talk about in just a minute, okay, are going to be these Leydig cells. So a couple of things about the spermatogenic cells, just a couple of points here. Uh, I probably won't ask you anything about these, but we'll just run, run through them real quickly. So we'll say we kind of hit those. All right, they're basically uh, supporting cells, the uh, Sertoli cells. So they nourish the spermatocytes, spermatitis, spermatozoa. Uh, any uh, excess uh, cytoplasm produced by the spermatids gets phagocytized by these Sertoli cells. They aid in uh, releasing the sperm into the lumen and control movement of those other cells. They secrete fluids so the uh, sperm can be transported. They secrete a hormone called inhibin, which decreases the rate of spermatogenesis and slows this whole process down. Now, the other cell, letter C, you'll see up here, okay? These are called Leydig cells, all right, or interstitial cells. We've used that term before, interstitial. So these are Leydig cells, and those secrete testosterone, which is the primary male sex hormone, right? So it says the most important androgen. <clears throat> for male sex hormone, androgen. All right, so letter D, all right, as we move on through uh, the testes here, okay, and through spermatogenesis, letter D uh, in spermatogenesis, okay, takes anywhere from, and we're going to look at a different view of this and kind of see what happens um, there, all right, using our uh, structures, our haploid and, haploid and diploid cells. All right, takes anywhere from 65 to 75 days, involves the following sequence of events. So we're going to walk through what we just covered here in those previous five steps. So we're, again, here's the lumen down here. Okay, here's the basement membrane right there. So in order of advancing maturity. So we have spermatogonia, all right, so which are diploid, two in state. Okay, they're going to develop from the germ cells. They are stem cells, and they're going to undergo mitosis. So they're going to divide, all right? Some of the daughter cells are going to differentiate into diploid primary spermatocytes, which you see here. So we're still in the 2N state because we just went through mitosis. We just replicated everything, 
Yeah. Now, we change up a little bit here. It says primary spermatocytes undergo meiosis 1 here, which results in, in the formation of haploid secondary spermatocytes. So now we went from this 2N state here, right, to the 1N state, okay, because now meiosis involves splitting of the chromosomes, right? So we're not re replicating, we're splitting or dividing these spermatids going to separate here, all right? Um, now, when we go to number four, it says the secondary spermatocytes are under, going to undergo meiosis two, and they're going to produce haploid spermatocytes, still in the one end state. And those lie close to the lumen, they're going to mature, which we refer to as a spermiogenesis, right there, spermiogenesis as they mature, and they're going to form spermatozoa, which are mature sperm cells. Okay? And then this, uh, the bullet point underneath just basically says fluid from the Sertoli cells, okay, um, from the sever, uh, or push the uh, uh, sperm, okay, from the symphoniferous tubules into what's called the ductus epididymis, right, where they complete their maturation, become capable of fertilizing an ovum, and the sperm are also stored in the ductus or vas deferens, which we'll look at in just a second, where they can be fertile for up to several months. Uh, some figures there, uh, don't worry about this first one, the maturing rate, they matured a rate of about 300 million per day, which you think about that, that's a pretty big number. Once they're ejaculated, I do want you to know this, they have a maximum life expectancy of about 48 hours, so they're still viable for about 48 hours within the female reproductive tract. And if we look at one of these sperm cells and see what they actually kind of look like, all right, uh, I got to erase all my marks again one more time. So here's a close-up of a sperm cell, so make sure you know the different parts of the sperm cell here when you look at it. Um, first region, right up here, and, and the labeling on this is a little bit different. They didn't call and ask how I would label this because I probably wouldn't do it right this way exactly, but we have the head of the sperm cell up here, which contains the nucleus, so be aware the nucleus is up in the head. And then it's mostly covered by, it looks like kind of like a gladiator helmet. Doesn't that kind of appear like a gladiator helmet right there? The name of that is the acrosome. So the acrosome covers the head, all right, protects the head of the sperm cell. Acrosome is a specialized lysosome, has enzymes in it, which help to aid in penetrating the mature egg. So it aids in helping fertilization occur, right? And then the rest of this is referred to as the tail. All right. So the tail consists of the following parts. You have the neck, which contains centrioles. Highlight that. You have the middle piece right here. The middle piece contains the mitochondria, which contains uh, basically those mitochondria are there to provide ATP. So uh, this thing can move right, and basically swim upstream, kind of, so to speak, kind of like a salmon. All right. So it provides ATP for locomotion. And then you have the principal piece down here, the longest part. And at the very end here, you have the end piece. So the principal piece is the longest part of the tail. Then you have the end piece, which is the part that tapers down. Now, that's the way we have to learn it. If, obviously, I think most of you would probably have done this the same way I would have. I would have called this the head. I would have called that the neck. I would have called that the body. And then I would have called that the tail. But this is the way it's... Uh, put together and the accepted terms for a sperm cell. So let's look at the whole reproductive system, uh, the ducts once again in males. So when we go back and look at the ducts here, they're going to look something like this. <clears throat> go to our next picture. That's what we want to look at there at our uh, sagittal section. Okay, so all this we just looked at took place in here, remember, in the seminiferous tubules, which are in these lobules between the septa of the tunica abigenia. So now, from the um, <clears throat> seminiferous tubules in here, the, the sperm is essentially going to move through the following sequence here, okay? Um, you're going to go from the seminiferous tubules to these structures here, which are called the straight tubules. From the straight tubules, they'll go right into the center here to the reti testis. And then from there, they're going to go to the efferent ducts. Remember, afferent, efferent, efferent is leaving. So these are the efferent ducts. 
the efferent ducts that are going to carry the sperm out of the testis into these tightly coiled structure right here called the ductus epididymis. That's the ductus epididymis right there. Okay. And the ductus epididymis is a part of this larger structure known as the epididymis. Epididymis is kind of a cup-shaped structure, right? It goes along the posterior part of the testis as well as over the top of it. Okay, right? So there's three main parts to it. Up here on the superior portion, we call it the head of the epididymis. And you can see these on our model, so we'll look at later. Okay, and then we have the body on the back side right here, and then it narrows and tapers down on the inferior end, and we call that the tail. So the ductus epididymis itself from here all the way to here is actually about six meters long, which translates out to about 20 feet. So this is coiled up. You have 20 feet of tubes here, tubules, all coiled up into the epididymis here. It's lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which has stereocilia. The cilia, kind of like in the digestive system, is there to increase the surface area for reabsorption of sperm cells that are essentially going to degenerate and die. It's also the site, the ductus epididymis, is going to be the site where sperm maturation occurs while they're being stored there. And then during ejaculation, the smooth muscle layers in the wall of the epididymis right, undergo peristaltic contractions and that propels the sperm from the ductus epididymis into this structure here called the ductus or vas deferens. So that's what we're going to look at next. <clears throat> so the ductus or vas deferens ascends from the tail of the epididymis here, goes along the posterior border of the epididymis, going to go through the inguinal canal, And it's going to enter the pelvic cavity. From there, it's going to travel over the side and then down the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. So let's move and go to our next picture where we'll see down here. And we'll see as it moves kind of back over the urinary bladder. If we get to the right picture. There we go. Okay, so here comes the ductus or vas deferens right here. It's going to come back over the posterior side of the bladder, urinary bladder, right there. The dilated terminal portion, once you get down to here, is called the ampulla of the ductus or vas deferens. So we'll probably just say vas from now on, V-A-S. So there's the ampulla where it enlarges right there. It's lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium with three layers of smooth muscle tissue. Function stores the sperm and moves it from the epididymis into what's known as the ejaculatory duct right there. And all these structures we can see on our model. So from the ampulla of the vas, it goes to the ejaculatory duct, which is located right posterior to the upper part of the prostate gland, which is this structure you see right underneath the bladder right there. <clears throat> So each ejaculatory duct, once again, this structure right here, is formed right, by the union of the vas deferens, or the ductus deferens right there, and the duct right here from the seminal vesicle, which is this structure that's all wrinkled up back here. Okay, So the duct from the seminal vesicle joins with the ampulla of the vas deferens and forms the ejaculatory duct right there. <coughs> Just prior to ejaculation, sperm and secretion from the seminal vesicles get ejected from the ejaculatory duct into the prostatic urethra right here. So there's your label, right? The urethra runs right through the middle of the prostate gland there. So the male urethra then becomes a passageway for both semen as well as urine. And it consists of three different parts. So we'll look at a sagittal view here, okay, of the male urethra. All right. And I have to go back up. 
one more time. I think there. Okay, back to our original picture. Okay, so here's our prostate gland. Here's the ejaculatory duct right there, all right, as it's formed by the union of the vas right there and the seminal vesicles or the ejaculatory duct. And this becomes the prostatic urethra right there. Here's the prostate gland. All right, urethra, three parts. First, you have the prostatic urethra, which is fairly short right here as it goes to the prostate gland. Next part is the membranous right here, or the intermediate urethra, which is the shortest part because it essentially is just going through the deep muscles of the pelvic floor or the perineal muscles. And then you have the third part, which is called the spongy or penile urethra as it comes here. So spongy or penile urethra as it passes through the corpus spongiosum of the penis. And the ending is down here at the very tip, which is known as the external urethral orifice. Now, if we go back to our uh, frontal view here, all right, and look at this one here. We'll see that the vas deferens here, this light, light colored tube right there. So there's your ductus or vas deferens coming through here. All right. As it comes up through the scrotum and goes through the inguinal canal here, there's a, a, some other various structures that are run alongside of it. So you have the testicular artery, which is in red. You have veins that drain the testes. So this series of veins, which are in blue right here, Write this down. They're known as the pampiniform plexus. So write that down next to the veins of the testis. So the pampiniform plexus is what these series of vessels are called. We're going to write that in the atlas as well. You have some lymphatic vessels as well in there. And once again, you have the cremaster muscle that runs alongside up through there as well. So together with the ductus deferens, all these structures here make up what is known as the spermatic cord so this whole structure is known the ring around it here as the spermatic cord so if we replace a pipe cleaner around that in the model uh, we'd be putting the pipe cleaner around the spermatic cord yeah all right and then you can cross out the last bullet point all right as it goes to the inguinal canal with the other structures that are listed right there yeah. so let's talk about the accessory sex gland so we'll go back and look at our sagittal uh, or our picture from the posterior side here one more time all right it's going to be this one <clears throat> so for accessory sex glands they're going to secrete most of the liquid portion of semen it consists of the two seminal vesicles one on the right one on the left so let's take this out and we'll highlight these okay so we have seminal vesicle here seminal vesicle on this side all right or seminal glands is the other term so they sit on the posterior side at the base of the urinary bladder, just in front of the rectum or anterior to it. They secrete an alkaline viscous fluid, so it means it's thick, right? Contains fructose, prostaglandins, and clotting proteins. So it's fairly thick, right? And it is alkaline. Highlight that. Make sure you know that. This fluid gets injected by way of the two ducts into the ejaculatory ducts right there, right? moves from there into the ejaculatory ducts, and it makes up about 60% of the volume of semen, 6-0. So make sure to know that number right there, 60% of the volume of semen right there, okay? Then we have the prostate gland, which is just beneath here, beneath the bladder. So a donut-shaped gland, because it has a hole right in the middle of it where things pass through, okay, sits beneath or inferior to the urinary bladder, surrounds the prostatic urethra, secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid, highlight acidic, contains citric acid, some enzymes, and its own antibiotic known as seminal plasmin. They are going to enter into the prostatic urethra here by way of several tiny little ducts, which we can't even see on our models there, called prostatic ducts. And it accounts for about 25% of the volume of semen. And you don't have to know that number, all right? Prostate gland makes up about 25%. The big point is you know that 60%. So the majority of uh, fluid in semen is from the seminal vesicles. Right? And then we find two little P-shaped glands that we're going to see down here. 
kind of underneath okay so these two little glands here and there's another one on this side these are known as the bulbo urethral or cowper's glands they sit underneath the prostate gland one on each side and they secrete an alkaline fluid as well that contains mucus into the spongy urethra by way of two different ducts so produces a mucus the secreted so uh, the big thing you need to know with this all right is that the only one of these three glands that are going to secrete an acidic solution would be the prostate so you have an alkaline solution from the seminal vesicles and an alkaline solution from the bulbo urethral glands okay. so they produce semen these three glands together produce semen which is a mixture of both sperm and seminal fluid secretions of the seminiferous tubule and accessory sex glands so that's what semen is made up of or consists of has the following notable features to it most of these i'm not going to ask you about the average volume two and a half to five milliliters average number of sperm cells 50 to 150 million per milliliter all right the seminal fluid provides the sperm with its transportation medium all right and nutrients what I do want you to know is letter D it has a slightly alkaline pH. You don't have to know the number, 7.2 to 7.7, right? Slightly alkaline, and you can remember that because two of the three glands are secreting alkaline fluid, right? And the purpose of that is to neutralize the environment, which tends to be acidic in both the urethra in the male and the vagina in the female. Okay. All right, so let's look at our uh, final structure here. We'll look at the penis. All right, so let me erase all my drawings here. All right, so view here and look at the picture down here in the corner so you can kind of see the frontal plane as this points or hangs straight down here and we take a cut, a frontal cut through here. Urethra of the penis delivers semen into the vagina as well as excretes urine and it has three main regions to it. So you have the body of the penis. So the body of the penis would be right through here. All right bulk of it right there contains three cylindrical masses of erectile tissue covered by a fibrous tissue called the tunica albuginea so we have tunica albuginea one more time the three masses would consist of first you have two dorsolateral so on the sides and on the back okay corpora cavernosa penis okay so corpora is plural for corpus you got one on the left one on the right so one on the back side all right so they're kind of front and back, or side and back, not front and back, but side and back. So these are the corpora cavernosa, and you have one smaller mid-ventral. So a lighter color here right on the inside, as well as at the uh, glands penis right here. You have one mid-ventral corpus spongiosum penis, which contains the spongy urethra. And here's the penile urethra, or the spongy urethra as it goes through the corpus spongiosum. So sexual excitation causes uh, blood to enter into the sinuses of these structures, right? Resulting in erection. And erection, know this, is a parasympathetic reflex. So parasympathetic reflex. And then prior to ejaculation, e term emission, E-M-I-S-S-I-O-N, discharges a small volume of semen. And then bullet point number three, ejaculation, which is the propulsion of the semen from the urethra to the outside, is a sympathetic reflex. So make sure you keep those straight. All right. Erection is parasympathetic. All right. Ejaculation is sympathetic. Second part here is going to be the glans penis, which is at the end down here. Glans penis is the enlarged distal end of the corpus spongiosum. So make sure you know that the corpus spongiosum. You can see those are consistent with each other right there. Margin of the glans penis right here is called the corona. And I like to tell everybody you will never look at a beer the same way again, probably, because uh, once you see that term and you know that that's what it is, every time you see a bottle of corona, all right, <laughs> your mind's probably going to go back to that, all right? Okay, the distal urethra at the very end here enlarges within the glans penis and forms an opening at the very end. This little slit is known as the external urethral orifice. And then going around the uh, glans penis, 
There's some loosely fitting skin, which is known as foreskin, or the loosely fitting what's called the prepuce, P-R-E-P-U-C-E. -E. And obviously the cutting or removal of that foreskin is known as a circumcision, if you want to write that down. And then we have the third part of the penis here, which is the root of the penis. <clears throat> Root of the penis essentially consists of the following parts, three major components. You have the bulb right here. So here's the bulb of the penis. It's ex basically the corpus spongiosum, once again, is expanded right there. <clears throat> Attached to the inferior surface of the muscles, the musculature, all right, of the perineum. <clears throat> And then we have the crura. I hate to pronounce that. It's always hard to pronounce that. Crus is singular. So crura, C-R-U-R-A, would be a right and a left. Crus. <clears throat> and these are part of the corpora cavernosa. So remember that. Okay. The bulb is part of the corpus spongiosum, but the crus, or the crura, all right, are part of the corpora cavernosa. <clears throat> The weight of the penis is supported by, there's a couple of ligaments here that I want to show you. And we'll go back to our frontal view there. Right. And right here. One more over. Okay, so we look at here. We got some structures that are going to help support. So the penis is, take a frontal cut right here. And you can see, all right, two different parts of the penis. All right. Weight of the penis is supported by what's called the fundiform ligament. Here it is right here under my cursor. So this forked light structure is called the fundiform ligament. Spelling right there. And the one right between the fork is the suspensory ligament right there. Okay. So that's all we need to highlight or write about right there. Okay. All right, so that takes us to the end of the male reproductive system right there. All right. And I think I'll have you write down just a couple of things here uh, off to the side. So a couple of things we didn't really talk about. Let's mention these. All right. So when we talked about the testes, all right. We said the testes tend to descend around month seventh, uh, month, uh, this last half of the seventh uh, month in fetal development, okay? But sometimes the testes fail to descend, all right? So you're doing a big teeter totter here, and the term for that is cryptocordism, undescended testis or testes, right? So that happens in about 5% of newborn males. So it's not that unusual for that to happen, right? Um, usually it'll be watched closely for a few months, uh, but if it's not corrected, if it doesn't descend on its own, uh, one or both don't descend on their own, uh, usually there's surgical intervention required after about six months, okay, six to 18 months. Uh, if we wait too long, the reason is if it does not, if those testes do not descend, then they stay up in the abdominal cavity where it's too warm, and essentially the um, um, the male will become sterile, cannot produce any offspring because the sperm are not viable at that point. Okay, so that's something to make sure that you're aware of there. Okay, um, we talked about a vasectomy. I think cutting, uh, so we take the vas deferens, and we're not going to put that as a <laughs> disorder, okay? It's a choice, obviously, for uh, uh, birth control. So a cutting of the vas is a vasectomy, which is a pretty simple procedure, much easier for a male to go through that, all right, than a female. The only time it might be more advantageous for females if there's a uh, um, procedure where the female Right. has to have the baby and has to undergo a C-section and she's her abdominal cavity is already exposed and open then they can actually do a tubal uh, they can tie the tubes at that point but generally most times it's much easier for the male to undergo a vasectomy than the female to uh, have 
or tubes type. All right? And then we'll mention and talk about prostate cancer and benign prostatic hypertrophy at the end of the chapter after we do female reproductive. Okay, so we'll stop there with male reproductive and that'll be the end of that uh, video. And we'll pick up with the second video uh, covers female reproductive system. All right. Very good.